This is Deborah Kaufman with Broadcast Beat. We're back again with two other panelists from our wonderful day of EMEA's Digital Asset Management Symposium. On my left, um, I have Jacob Rosenberg from Bandito Brothers. On my right, Tom Weiss from Photocam. And both of these fellows were here talking about their work starting on Dust to Glory, uh, through Act of Valor, and up through Need for Speed, correct? Yeah, that's right. All right, so uh, tell me a little bit about how the movies have changed and how the workflow has changed. Well, we first met 10 years ago uh, on a project that I met my current business partners on called Dust to Glory. And uh, that was a, uh, a shoot that had nine different camera formats, high definition, Super 16, a bunch of different video formats, and about 250 hours of raw data, which at that time was pretty substantial considering it was primarily a film-centric uh, time for movie making. And uh, we sort of developed a kindred spirit with Tom, who was uh, at, at Laser Pacific at that time. And we sort of went off and made a digital intermediate that was using compressed file formats. And, and, uh, and that sort of created a light bulb for us in terms of what the backbone of our company is. So if you sort of fast forward to where we are today, you know, I think we're still you know, data centric um, in the sense that we're shooting multiple cameras with varying different file formats and we're having to collect and organize that data and, uh, and we're, bit, we're you know, trying to build that DI ourselves in our own facility. Um, which mirrors what we did a long time ago, but the, uh, the file sizes have become a lot bigger. Um, the clarity and the resolution of those files have become bigger, but the ambition and the scope of, of what we're trying to capture has remained the same, and the desire to sort of collaborate with people who can keep up and are up to speed with the latest technology has been really important. Well, and they've all been really fabulous movies, and I know that you've, uh, you've, you've partnered for all of them. Tell me a little bit, Tom, about how you know, what, what was the learning curve with the first one, and how have you learned with each movie? How has the, how the workflow evolved? Wow. Um, well, the, the first film, you know, was really the early days of, of dealing with HD cameras, the cameras like the, F9, the Sony F900 and, and uh, some of the Panasonic cameras that they used on the film. And at that time, it was really tape-based. We were very tape-centric. Everything got output to a tape. It got digitized by a tape. Um, and, and at the time, we were seeing this really great spirit of independence coming out of this team. So we were really behind them and, and wanting to support their vision and, and, and how they and how they told stories. So, you know, we, we went to great lengths to to make sure that we were able to, you know, take these these random formats and actually normalize them and give them something. And, and actually that's what we're doing today. It's it hasn't really changed that much except for now we're dealing with terabytes of data and we're dealing with uh, high resolution cameras and we're dealing with you know um, many many more hours of footage uh, that they're shooting in a day so uh, I think I think from our perspective it's it's really supporting the spirit of independence and and the bandito way is really you know it's really invigorating for us it's exciting for us well I know one of the this is a digital asset symposium and one of the things we talked about was well how long do you hang on to these assets for how do you save them in a way that you can access them easily? Do you want to? Can you address that a little bit, Jacob? Well, I mean, you know, we're, we we still are a little bit in the dark ages in that we have the majority of our assets spread across multiple multiple redundant drives. Um, it, it allows us for faster access and faster connectivity. Any project can be pulled up on a drive, and actually, you can edit off of those drives immediately. Um, so, you know, some of our higher risk or uh, more valuable assets are in long-term storage and secured in different ways, but primarily we're still drive-based for storage, and obviously we have massive RAID systems that are always on that have the majority of the active assets or have assets for a set period of time that need to be live and need to be sort of on that RAID environment. How, how searchable are these assets? You know, again, I mean, they're, they're, they're easily searchable, um, but there's no you know, a giant uh, Excel type of, or, you know, search uh, keyword uh, type of mechanism for that. I mean, what the tool that, that Tom and his team developed, uh, Next Lab over at Photochem, is, is something that fits perfectly for us on a show-by-show -show basis. Um, but in general, you know, we're, we're a production services company. So we're working with content and delivering content the majority of time. When we get on a big feature film, we have the infrastructure like Next Lab at our facility actually while we were doing the project so that we had the ability to search and get that data as we needed to. Um, but that bigger search infrastructure, we have the deliverables for the commercials, but we rarely need to pull up the raw footage a year later. 
Well, that, that, that really is to the point because you're involved in the production. I know you said you'll keep those assets live for a very long period of time, but it, it does kind of bring up the question, you know, Next Lab is so amazing for as a production tool for you know, the editing and the, everything you need to do with the production mm -hmm. assets. Is there any interest or, or possibility of expanding that into kind of a more live archive, digital so, asset? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, right now we are actually supporting productions where Next Lab lives well beyond production. So you'll have instances where a Next Lab system goes into editorial after they've shot all of their, their content and they actually use it as a tool to track all their assets, to go back and do visual effects pulls, to go back and do conform pulls. So we are going into th that realm of, of a true asset manager for, for a given project. And for us, we, we typically do a, a three-tiered approach for storage in, in, in our deployments. It's typically fast, you know, high-speed uh, uh, storage, SAN-type storage first. That's our tier one. Tier two is a NAS-type volume that has, you know, it's really thick and has, you know, hundreds of terabytes of space, and then a tier three is obviously that long-term LTO archive. So that's our approach, and that's what we have to do to protect ourselves and to protect our customers' assets. But but beyond that, we are really becoming the hub of all this data for for production through the whole life of, their, of, the, of the film. And do you see, is Photochem going to become a home for the long-term storage? I mean... I don't know. You know, there are, there are so many companies out there that are vying for that uh, with the studios directly. Um, I know that we are going to be a jumping off point for a lot of that, and, and we're going to make sure that we are, are relevant and that we're able to actually feed relevant data and information into those asset managers in the future so that it's not just disparate content that's coming on LTO drives. There's meaning to all that, that data. Right. Otherwise, it's, it's not useful, right? That's right. And, and I know that you were talking about how there's, you know, the media, the amount of data is just increasing by leaps and bounds, and of course, then there's 4K and high frame rate and high, you know, oh, dynamic stere range. Stereo 4K, stereo 6K. Forget it. Like those files are that a, a film, a stereo 6K film, would would just be a multi, just so much bigger than anything that most production companies would be used to handling. You'd have to ease into that, but if you were dropped into a project like that, you'd be drowning in seconds. Well, I know that you've created this workflow that, you know, more established members of our production community could have turned their noses up at, like, oh, you're doing what? You're doing how much compression? Yeah. I mean, are you going to be able to do that same kind of seat of the pants kind of uh, production with much richer yeah. data? I mean, I, I think I think we have to. I mean, I think that's part of who we are. I mean, we, you know, we, we like to go in the direction that we think is the right direction um, because we're chasing something down. And, and I feel like when we chase that down and when we capture that, it, it's special because we, we have a unique point of view and a unique approach. And I, I would never want to change that approach. But I sort of like to surround myself and we like to surround our company with like-minded people, you know, such as Tom, who, who can provide some of that grounding expertise when we get over our heads. But I think, you know, I, I think that compression has proved to be something that um, doesn't hinder the quality potential of a project if you're using the right compressed format. And obviously for the last 10 years we've had incredible results with the Cineform um, file format. Um, and. You know, and then you also use the Cinefilm tools. Yeah, for... we use the Cinefilm denoise and texturing tools, which have also given us great results for the theatrically released films that we've done. I mean, you can absolutely tell a difference on the denoised and textured material on the big screen if it was digitally acquired. And I think n not that many people, which is nice, are, are privy to the power of those tools. It's not just adding grain, it's actually adding texture. And you get a texture artist who actually is looking at creating texture so that that digital image doesn't have too much of that digital snap. But as the different generation of filmmakers come, come up through the ranks, that notion of texture and you know grain will not be in their vocabulary of storytelling. So it's just taste and choices. And Well, perhaps maybe they'll just like the fact that the image looks better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one thing we can count on is stuff is getting smaller, resolution is improving, and some things are getting cheaper. Um, but data is growing exponentially. So what are you working on now that's pushing the envelope? Are you two partnering on another project? I mean, I'm sure we'll, we, you know, we're, we're, we're always working on something. You know, you want to be in the business of being busy. And fortunately, we've been very busy with commercial projects and feature projects and development. And, you know, um, I mean, for, for sure, Tom has tons of projects he can't talk about. Exactly. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, you know, we have a number of commercial projects. We have 
uh, we had a, a recent project that I did that was on National Geographic about the history of land speed racing and another music documentary that I'm working on that is coming out this summer. And it's, so are, are either of you being asked to work in 4K, high dynamic range, high frame rate? So we are, we're actually very interested in supporting HFR projects um, and HDR projects. We've actually started to develop tools to support things like, uh, you know, 60 frame acquisition and how do we make Avid media for that and how do we make deliverables for that. So we are heavily looking at, at, at that because there's some filmmakers out there that are really convinced and, and rightly so that the higher the frame rate, the, the, the experience is going to be that much better and that much different. So, you know, we've been talking to some filmmakers that want to shoot 120 frames per second and, and in stereo at 4K. So there's no question that that is a future for us in, in Next Lab and at Photocam. And what about you, Jacob? I, I think we're, we're always uh, big believers in what the material asks for. And I think if there was something that required uh, hyper-realism, you know, we would look at ways to achieve that, one of them being high frame rate. Um, I don't, you know, we're, we, while we do and em, embrace digital, we still love film. You know, we still love that aesthetic. Um, we're not afraid of stereo or any of that stuff. It just, I think the material has to ask, when you envision the material, it has to be that way. But there's nothing specifically that I could say, yes, that's what we're doing. But we have the infrastructure and we have the, the support and we have our, our VFX post company, Cantina Media that has been doing a ton of visual effects work and dealing with stereo work and high frame rate work and, and working in high dynamic range environments and so forth. So, we're, you know, we're, we try to be prepared for whatever, right? The luck best fits the man prepared for it, so. Well, I'm looking forward to the next project that you, you two partner on. I, I know it'll be fantastic. And the rest of you stay tuned for our next interview from the Digital Asset Symposium held by EMEA in Hollywood.